wasn't expecting you today. Uh, welcome to the beautiful Burnie Beach. I'm um, actually about to set out on a bit of an expedition if you wanted to join me. I'm going to explore the science of sea level rise. It's all quite exciting and I've heard that Burnie is actually a really good place to do it. Come on, let's go. I work here in Burnie as a surveyor, which basically means that I spend a lot of time measuring things. Now, it's easy to measure something that's square and solid. You can measure the edges to find out the area. Then if you measure the height, you can work out the volume. But how do you measure something as big and as wobbly as the sea? Well, that's what we're going to find out. Now to do that, we have to meet the main character of our story. Let me introduce the sea. All right, I know you've already met, but look again, because what you're seeing is a very small part of a very big ocean. How big is the sea? The oceans cover over two thirds of the Earth's surface and have a surface area of about 362 million square kilometers. That number sounds pretty big, but what does it mean? Well, the whole of Australia is 7.7 .7 million square kilometers, so it would take 47 Australias to cover the whole ocean. And Tassie is only 68,000 square kilometers, so the sea is 5,300 times bigger. And how much water is stored in that huge area? Well, the average depth of the sea is about 3.7 kilometers, so we can calculate the volume as 1.3 billion cubic kilometers. That is over 1.3 billion trillion liters of water in the whole ocean. That's a lot of water. Not only is the sea huge, it is also hugely dynamic. There are waves caused by the wind that affect the sea surface. There are tides caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun. There are huge currents that push water around the earth. And even the gravity of the land masses on earth itself pull the water into some places more than others. All of these effects add together to make a sea that is constantly moving. Each of these is like a small piece in the puzzle of sea level, and each one needs to be understood if we want to know how that huge amount of water in the ocean is changing. OK, so the sea is huge and it moves a lot. To even try and imagine measuring something so massive and changeable is a little bit crazy, but people have actually been measuring sea level for hundreds of years which is why I've brought you here to Port Arthur. There's something I want to show you, a special piece of Tasmanian history out on the Isle of the Dead. is a sea level benchmark carved way back in 1841. Now, by itself, this can't tell us much about sea level change, but not long ago, some of the old tide measurements were found. And because these old charts are referenced back to this mark, it means that we can figure out what sea level is doing 180 years ago. Without a time travel machine, that's about as close as we can get to a direct comparison. So if the sea level has changed in the last 180 years, then a mark like this gives us a pretty good clue about how much. <laughs> now, technology has improved a bit since that mark was carved on the rock. These days we rely on the marvellous modern tide gauge to tell us about sea level. Now what a tide gauge does is it, well I mean it gauges the tide, you know, it's not rocket science. No, the rocket science only came when we started measuring sea level from space. Tide gauges to satellites. We know the tide comes in and out each day, but how are tides measured? The earliest tools used for this were tide staffs, which are basically big rulers in the water that had to be read manually. Then came early tide gauges, which used a float that would rise and fall with the changing water level. The float was put inside what is called a stilling well to 
help block out the waves, and at the other end was a pen that would draw the pattern of the tide on a roll of paper. Modern tide gauges do the same job using more advanced technology, usually by measuring the time it takes for a pulse to hit the water and come back. There are currently hundreds of tide gauges all over the world keeping watch over sea level. Tide gauges are great because they can measure the water level very frequently, but they can only be used on coastlines. What if we want to know the water level in the middle of the ocean? A new kind of satellite was designed to solve this problem, called a satellite altimeter. Like modern tide gauges, these satellites measure the water level by sending a pulse down to the ocean surface and measuring the time it takes for the pulse to return. By measuring this time very precisely, the distance between the satellite and the ocean can be figured out to the nearest centimetre or two. Satellite altimeters orbit around the Earth incredibly fast, covering pretty much the whole ocean in just 10 days. Together, satellite altimetry and tide gauges are helping to paint the picture of the ups and downs of sea level all over the world. Now you might think that's the end of the story. Now that we've got satellite altimetry to measure basically the whole ocean, well, surely the measuring sea level problem is solved, right? Well, it might not be that simple. To start with, what do we do with all these measurements? And how can we be sure that the satellites are right? Well, to answer these questions, we need to find ourselves a sea level scientist. And luckily, Tassie has some of the best. Which is why I'm here with Chris the scientist from Utah to tell us more. So, Chris the scientist, is there a way that we can check these satellites? And is that even important? Yeah, look, it's uh, super important. It's a big part of the mission design, actually, to um, you know, determine how accurate the satellites are and, and really importantly, to see if that accuracy is changing um, in time. And we do that um, a few different ways. Um, and one of the, the main ways that we do that involve three sites that are dotted around the world. And NASA have their site off the Californian coast. Uh, the French Space Agency, CNES, they have their site uh, off Corsica in the Mediterranean Sea. The European Space Agency have just recently started one in Greece as well. But the Australians have had a long involvement in satellite altimetry um, now as well. And we run a site in Bass Strait. It's about 40 kilometres northwest of Burnie. Wow! So that's why Burnie's important in the whole measuring sea level then? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that we want to do is basically pick a X marks the spot out in the ocean and we want to measure sea level hopefully as accurately as we can but using a different technique so that every time the satellite flies overhead we can compare our measurements with the measurements from the satellite and basically keep them in check and see whether or not they're behaving as we would expect them to. Ah, so, so what do you actually use to check the satellite measurements then? So we've got a few different ways to do it. One of the main uh, ways in Bass Strait, we actually have uh, instrumentation that's actually moored on the ocean floor. So rather than starting up here and measuring down to the ocean surface, we actually measure up to the ocean surface. So it's actually measuring the pressure of the ocean. We also measure the temperature and the density of the water. And from that, we can kind of infer sea level. Um, another sort of important part of the jigsaw puzzle is to use buoys that have GPS receivers, a bit like your mobile phone or your tablet. Uh, GPS receivers, a little bit more accurately, of course. So those uh, different pieces of the puzzle come together, enable us to measure sea level really, really accurately. We have the tie gauge at Bernie as well uh, that we use, and that le uh, leaves us with a measurement that we can compare every time the satellite flies overhead. Well, that's so interesting. The, uh, how did you get interested in all this? Well, look, good question. I went to university and I didn't really know what I would like to study and I met a couple of scientists and one so happened to be an Australian expert in sea level science and it really just fascinated me. I think it's absolutely incredible that these spacecraft are, are orbiting at about seven kilometres a second. They're making measurements something like 20 times a second. They're 1,200 kilometres up in space um, and yet we're measuring a signal that's really, really small yet really, really critical. You know, sea level rise is going to affect so many millions of people and also have a massive consequence on the environment. Uh, measuring sea level, I just think it's fascinating. Um, and uh, ever since I've, I've been hooked and stuck with it. Well, thanks so much for talking to us, Tris. Yeah, no worries. I think that we should head back to Bernie to have a look. Well, here we are back in Bernie, right where the science happened. Now on the wharf just behind me, you can see our very own tide gauge. 
Now that's been running since 1993, so it's one year older than me. And it's such an important instrument in the whole satellite calibration side of things. And then just beside it, you can see we've got Burr 2. Now that's what we call a continuously operating reference station. But it's basically just a pretty fancy GPS that you leave running all the time. Now, one of the interesting things this does is it gives us a really long record of any movement in the wharf. So you can imagine if the wharf was slowly sinking, then our tide gauge would be getting closer and closer to the sea surface and it would make it look like the sea was rising faster than it really was. So by having Bird 2 there, we can make sure that our tide gauge measurements are really accurate. So now we know how we can measure sea level and we know this data has been being collected for quite a while now. But what is the data telling us? Well, to find that out, I think it might be time for some graphs. The changing sea. Thanks to satellite altimetry and tide gauges all over the world, scientists are able to calculate the global mean sea level every 10 days. Global mean sea level is the average sea level over the whole ocean. And the results? Since 1900, sea level has been rising at 1 or 2 millimetres a year. Now that might not sound like very much, but in the last 20 years, that rate has increased to a bit over 3 millimetres each year. That means that, on average, the ocean is about 20 centimetres higher now than it was in 1900. With the help of satellite altimetry, scientists have now shown that not only is the sea rising, but that sea level rise is increasing. If this trend continues, sea level rise will get faster and faster over the years. Predictions show that if we do a lot of work to slow it down, the sea level may rise by less than 50 centimetres by the year 2100. However, if nothing is done, the sea could rise by up to or even more than a metre by then. There are still a lot of questions about sea level rise that scientists are trying to answer, but some things are now very clear. The ocean is rising, and it's speeding up. But where is all this extra water coming from? What causes the sea to rise? Well, we're here in the Handsworth Laboratory, otherwise known as my kitchen, to find out. Now, there are two main things that cause the sea to rise. Heat and ice. Let's look at heat first. Now, the atmosphere on Earth has been heating up, thanks mostly to all the extra greenhouse gases we've been putting into it. And the oceans actually absorb over 90% of this extra heat. And just like the water in this bottle, the oceans expand as they warm up. The second main cause of sea level rise is melting ice. Now, this one can get a bit confusing because ice that is already floating, so like up at the Arctic near the North Pole, well, that doesn't contribute to sea level rise at all. It's ice that is on land, like in Antarctica and Greenland, that causes the sea level to rise. And the problem is the ice in Antarctica and in Greenland in particular is melting faster and faster every year. At this point you might be thinking, oh, gee Andy, thanks for showing me all the cool science happening in Burnie, but why should I care about sea level rise? Three millimetres a year sounds pretty small and the tides already change by more than a metre every day, so what are you worried about? Well, look, the water level does change a lot with the tides, but imagine if the high tide was a metre higher than it is now. There are places, even in Tassie, that would be flooded every time the tide came in. And there's a lot of land around the world that would be underwater in that kind of scenario. We'd also start to see more erosion of our beaches. And the other thing about sea level rise and climate change is that extreme events, so like the bad flooding we had a few years ago, 
Well, that'd start to happen more frequently. Events that used to happen once in every 100 years might happen once in every 10 years. Eventually, they might happen every year. And look, I know that three millimetres a year doesn't sound like much. It is tiny. It's about this much. But since I was born, the sea has already risen about this much. And by 2050, so in 30 years, well, I might just need bigger gumboots. Now here we are, right back where we started, on Burnie Beach. Now you know about the satellites zipping past overhead and the GPS boys riding the waves just over the horizon. Science is being done here and everywhere. It's incredible. And science is, well, it's like a compass. A compass points towards north. It doesn't tell you which way to go, but it helps you to not get lost. Now science doesn't give us all the answers, but it increases our knowledge. And that can start to point us in the right direction. With the huge challenge of climate change, it can be hard to know where to start, but we have started. And now we need more scientists and people who can think scientifically, like you, to help us understand better. And we need artists and people who can think creatively to tell us the story help us decide which way to go. But before we go, I want to show you a bit of magic. My feet just now were surrounded by thousands of tiny water molecules. And there's a chain of these connecting me to every other beach, and shoreline and sea cliff in the world. The ocean brings us together. It's something we all share. Looking at it like this, it's easy to see we're all part of the same global community. Together, through science, we can understand our oceans better. And maybe then we can start to take better care of our homes. Thanks for joining me and good luck.